Sandra, how are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me to join you today. Thank you. Thank you for accepting this request in a such a short notice. We got in touch last week. Uh, I was looking for you um, uh, upon request of people, but also for myself. I wanted to know how I can approach uh, different markets for work. So I found our first conversation uh, very interesting. And that's why I thought a lot of people would also benefit from that. And um, also felt that our connection was quite good and the value that you brought in was very interesting. So I'm excited about this conversation and looking forward to get to know more about you personally and also mm -hmm. professionally and share that with other people. So how are you today? Good. <laughs> <laughs> how do you introduce yourself to people usually? What do you say? Well, usually it depends on the context. If Personally, I usually start by saying that I'm from Austria originally. Mm -hmm. um, I left Austria in 2002, so I have been an Austrian living abroad for the last 18 years. Mm -hmm. I have in the last years, in the last 18 years, lived and worked in nine countries. Okay. I started out actually in Budapest, uh, Hungary. Mm -hmm. where I worked as an executive search consultant. And then I moved to Ecuador and Mexico, where I worked in marketing and sales. And then I wanted to learn Polish because of my roots. So I moved to Warsaw, to Poland. And then because I have been working digitally with my team for the last seven years, I took that opportunity and I worked out of Ecuador, I spent half a year there, then one year in Berlin, mm -hmm. then in total 12 years in Warsaw, Poland, now in Lisbon, Portugal. So I come around, I, well, probably I should stop saying I'm originally from Austria and just say I'm a global citizen. <laughs> yes, it sounds more like that. How many languages do you speak? I'm imagining. Six. Six languages. Wow. So that's fluently, the way I do, the way I usually define them for fluently. Uh -huh. So I speak and work uh, in German, English, Spanish, and Polish, mm -hmm. and under the influence of wine, uh, French, and Portuguese. <laughs> under the influence of wine. Yes, <laughs> I can speak Russian also. In, under the influence. <laughs> Don't but, we all? <laughs> right. So wow, what what made you choose that journey, that this this lifestyle in the first place? Were you, have you ever worked in an office like yes, like yes. I mean, initially yes at the very beginning, oh. I while studying and then afterwards my first jobs were corporate jobs. I was an executive search consultant, going to the office every day for eight, ten, twelve hours. I would work out of an office in Warsaw. I also worked in Belgium in spain so yeah definitely going to the office was part of it and i'm probably the kind of person that loves freedom that's why i also chose to set up my own company called career angels and that was 10 years ago it will be exactly 10 years ago in june 2020 so having freedom is something very important to me and freedom also means I'm free to choose my location. Mm. So I actually sat down and made an analysis because I really wanted to know how many countries I have visited in the last three years. So from the 1st of January, 2017 to December 31st, 2019. So in the period of three years, I had been to 31 countries. 31, that wow. 31 countries. So I basically, out of three years, I spent almost one year on the road traveling. Amazing. While still working all the time. So I, I called it then my travel office, not home office, but my travel office. So I switched in the last three years. I switched a lot between home office and travel office. Right. Wow. It, should I ask you how was that journey? I was going to ask you how was that journey, but it just sounds like fantastic. But I believe there's not always good things. There's also some challenges, right? Of course. Um, working from home already requires 
a certain amount of discipline working while traveling i would say even more because i mean you yourself have a international traveling background so you know how it is traveling sounds interesting and exciting but if you do it a lot it is often lack of sleep delayed planes getting up at three o'clock in the morning uh, commuting trying to find an address in a country where google maps doesn't work which by the way happens in morocco um etc etc so of course there are hiccups while traveling it is exhausting but having said that it's also super re rewarding mm -hmm. so I can imagine, I can imagine. But yeah, I'd say discipline is a big part of it to be sure to actually get up an hour, two or three, especially when traveling with other people, get up before the rest is up to get to go through the hundred emails, to reply to clients, to have career consultations. So either do that in the morning or make sure you arrange that with the group of people that you're traveling to then have like an afternoon off or well let us go to a museum I then would hang back and do some work so there's also discipline and compromises mm -hmm. and then working with a team that is probably sitting in different places in the world right yeah, yeah. Um, my team is now over 20 people and everybody works from home mm. and that and we've been working from home since 2013 right so everybody also takes advantage of that differently we do have an office which um, for historical reasons i was in poland when i set up my business so the office is physically in warsaw um but very often it's an empty an empty office um right. sometimes uh -huh. there's one people one person coming to the office sometimes two sometimes it's empty for two days so the whole situation with the confinement and quarantine and what's happening with the corona is not really changing a lot to your um, lifestyle, office lifestyle, let's no. call it like that. Not at all, right? For us, it's business as usual. It's the same. Business as usual. Okay. So with what's happening right now in the world with um, confinement and corona and everything, are you getting different type of demands from people who are reaching out to you or is it a little bit the same? Mm, that's actually a good question i think well we had and we re reinforced a certain initiative called uh, 100 sessions mm -hmm. where with a group of independent uh, coaches and consultants we offered career consultations for people candidates on the job market who wanted to talk mm -hmm. either talk about something very specific or about the job market, about how to find a job, et cetera. And here actually the demand was a little bit different than usually mm -hmm. because some of the people, some of the candidates simply wanted to talk and vent. They're afraid. They don't know what will happen to their current jobs or they don't know if they had already lost their jobs. They don't know how to behave, how fast to react. Mm -hmm. So we usually don't get those requests for somebody simply to say, I want to talk about my fears or I want to talk about how to manage my frustrations or how not to let it affect my family, etc. So maybe the conversations have become to a certain extent a bit more emotional. Oh, very interesting. I wouldn't have expected this type of um, mm -hmm. requests or not really requests, but like conversations. But I guess given that support and that ear to listen to them, it's a part of what you should be doing, right? Like what you'd be doing. Mm. So uh, like you had this massive global experience and now knowing what's going on in the world, how, what do you think, where do you think this is all going? What's happening? with the job markets, with the search, with people losing jobs. What's your personal opinion on that or professional opinion on that? Mm -hmm. um, I did get that question before we started talking. So I had some time to think about it. Mm. And I, I have, well, based on the observations and the requests we receive and the type of preparation and conversation topics i would say that the world is divided into two different types of countries 
because there are countries where the government supports companies and their employees and there are countries that don't and in countries where there is no direct immediate support people are unemployed much much faster and then you have instruments like Kurzarbeit in um, Germany, Austria, and to a certain extent in Switzerland, which means that people who would be un would already be unemployed in other countries mm. receive the opportunity to get up to a hundred percent of their salary, usually about 70, 80 percent, while working 10 to 50 percent. And if somebody, if that workforce were employed in a different country, they simply would have lost their jobs. So in terms of what's happening, I would say in the countries where there's no direct immediate support, the unemployment is immediate. And in other countries where there are government supporting companies and the workforce, the unemployment is delayed by about three to six months. Okay. So which just... then by consequence delay certain things because there are countries that you can already see an immediate effect where there is already an increase in unemployment and there are the countries where these, for example, the number of unemployments are delayed or hidden in Kurzarbeit, etc. Right, which means there will be an, an unemployment at some point. That's what you, you say. I believe so. Looking at what's happening, I mean, we are in a global complex economy. So uh, we all sooner or later influence each other as we could see with the coronavirus. So we are not isolated and the economies are not isolated. So the, co the, the countries and the employees in the countries that are more protected will also feel a more direct impact but with a delay but a delay okay okay so what do you think will have to happen then in in the near future like would people people would have to find new jobs right? some of them already have to yes some already already have to and what do you think the um are they do you think they will be having to change the type of jobs or type of care they've been doing or rather find companies that can host them and employ them in the same field depending on the person's profile either mm. one or the other mm. there are obviously industries that have temporarily ceased to exist mm -hmm. hotels aviation etc yeah. so they will have to temporarily move to a different industry mm some will not be able to go back and then they will have to reskill and change profession change industry etc so depending on each individual's own situation it will be changing temporarily unless they have a financial cushion and they can actually wait it out for the next three to six months and if they can they will have to find employment in a non-related industry or non-related profession and then you have those who will be able to stay within their own profession, but they need to improve their competencies. Mm -hmm. To give an example, marketing people. There is a big generation of marketing professionals that have been working for 10, 15, 20 years that are not that familiar with social media and digital marketing and supporting e-commerce, et cetera. So they have to immediately start upgrading their competencies and should immediately improve their skills. Right. That will be on demand. Yes. So anything, so if an individual is in a situation they well should go through and then their own, let's say audit their own industry, profession, et cetera, and say, are my competencies up to date? Do I know digital? Do I know how to work with big data? Do I know how the various IT or e-tools work? Am I familiar with the computer? Are my language still skills good enough, et cetera, et cetera. So basically you're saying that during this time of 
either unemployment or maybe will be unemployment at some point for some, they should use this time to reskill, to learn, to get the best out of it, right? Because yeah. there will be demands, but maybe not necessarily the exact same type of demands. Exactly. And position. my recommendation is to start that immediately. Mm. In the past, a lot of candidates, especially when they were in countries where they didn't really speak the language yet or were starting to learn slowly, um, very often the candidate's attitude was, once they hire me, I'll learn it. Mm. Once the company hires me, I'll learn digital or I'll improve my German or I'll improve my French. Mm. That will not fly anymore. Right now and overnight, the job market switched from a candidate market to an employer market which means companies can really literally cherry pick the best possible candidates in a job market. Mm -hmm. So they will not go for people who will learn it maybe once they get hired, but they need people who already have the set of skills. I see. Yeah. I think a very valuable input here for people that are listening. What do you think there will be? Uh, what are the demands that you think there will be uh, out there? What will be, what will the employee years and recruiters be looking for? Here again, we need to divide divide the job, the, the, let's say the talent pool into different segments. Mm -hmm. Because my answer will be different if you ask what will they require from top managers. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say, well, anything, strong leadership skills, restructuring, change management, interim business process optimization, digitalization, etc. If you look at middle management, being able to lead a team remotely, excellent communication skills, being able to use the various tools online, make sure that they're up to date with competencies, like maybe I'll call them of 2020, so digital, e-analytical, etc. And then you have the other segment of um, the the skilled workers that temporarily can't really, for example, a waitress. Mm. A waitress, okay, what would the waitress do or a waiter? So they then definitely need to move to a different industry or a different profession. So, and here in terms of what's in demand, you, I think we can, relatively easily co come to certain conclusions observing how our habits have changed while staying at home mm. so we don't go out to restaurants anymore which means we order in so there's a demand for couriers and delivery people and then instead of going to shops so retail is out but like non-food retail is out but we are order Amazon has declared that they will hiring 100,000 people to make up for the demand. So is it an ideal situation for, I started now with the waitress example, is it an ideal situation for a waitress to work in a warehouse? No, but temporarily it might be a solution. I see. Okay. And then so um, in terms of soft skills, is there some input there that you can add? Like. Mm -hmm. Um, soft skills. I think particularly now it is, has everything to do with communication, communicating online, mm -hmm. emotional intelligence online. You lead a team differently when it's remote. You train people differently when you train them online versus onboarding a new employee i mean there is a difference between being able to sit next to somebody and pointing with the finger and then you click here and then you do this and then you do that and it's very different uh, than onboarding somebody online mm -hmm. so it it is more of the same but in this digital remote context i see okay makes sense and so when, when, if you, you want to, if, if it's okay, we go back to uh, what is it that you specifically do? I, I'm curious to know mm. um, how your, you help people mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a company on, and yourself uh, and 
where can you actually add value to them when they reach mm -hmm. out to you? So we have different types of sit cases, situations um, approaching us. Usually when somebody gets in touch with us, they know what it is they're looking for, but sometimes somebody doesn't know. So sometimes when helping people find jobs, so we are not recruiters. We have, let's say, reversed the recruitment process. So we don't look for um, companies we don't look for candidates for companies, but actually we look for companies for the candidates. So we have reversed that, that um, dynamics on the job market. So maybe I'll, I'll explain it from a different perspective. When somebody is looking for a job, there are four steps to follow. First step, what is it that you, what kind of job are you looking for? What is your career goal? Where do you see yourself in a month, in two years and five years? The second step is then to say, how do I position myself and what are my strengths from the perspective of my target and target group? Third step, prepare CV and LinkedIn profile. Fourth step, generate interest, generate interviews, generate job offers. Now, every person who gets in touch with Career Angels is at a different stage of those four steps. So if somebody doesn't know what it is they're looking for, we help them find out. If somebody knows exactly what it is they're looking for, but sometimes they don't know how to sell themselves. They don't know what their unique selling proposition is. So we help them, we sit down and we analyze their profile. And because we work with, now I can say more than 5,000 people over the last years, we can actually tell them, listen, compared, comparing you to the other hundreds of, I don't know, finance directors, you are actually better in these two things than the others. So this could be your unique selling proposition. And then take it further. Some know they are good and they're good at selling themselves. They know what it is they're looking for, but they don't know how to put it onto paper. So then we talk CVs. Um, good managers don't have to be good CV writers. Obviously, there are people who specialize in that, like us. So we actually then take over the CV writing. We take over the how to set up a LinkedIn profile when you write CVs. And this is one of the things the coronavirus has also done. The coronavirus has accelerated trends that were already happening. So now with this flood of CVs to recruiters and companies, where a human being can't keep up with that really a flood of CVs, somebody, somebody or something needs to analyze the CVs that are coming in. So we have applicant tracking systems. Now, not all CV formats are good for those applicant tracking systems that scan the CV. So you need to know how to prepare CV for those softwares so your CV is properly uploaded into the database and properly then categorized. Um, then on LinkedIn, the LinkedIn algorithm has its, I don't, well, tricks and uh, you need to know how to fill out a, for, a LinkedIn profile so a recruiter looking for somebody with your set of skills will actually find you. So that's how we, how we help and we can help. Then there are different ways of generating interest. Not everybody knows how to network or how to build a new work network if they're in a new, new country. Not everybody knows how and what kind of recruiters to reach out to. Not everybody knows what kind of companies to target, who to target, how to email them, how to generate uh, interest in a company that they actually want to work for. Not everybody knows how to apply to job ads, which might seem to be the easiest thing but apparently it's not because of technology. So looking at the whole puzzle and I mean, on the one hand, you might think, okay, it's four steps. Sounds easy. And I'd say it's simple, but it's not easy because there's a lot of background information to know, especially from this technology perspective.
I can go on and on about that. So please interrupt me. <laughs> and then, so you, do you do this, all of it for them or do you coach them and teach them how Both. to do it and they do it for themselves? Both. Both. Right. Everybody is different and has different needs. And I have to say that everybody also has a different budget. Yeah. So if somebody says, listen, I'm a CEO, I could work anywhere in Europe and I speak four languages and I currently have a job and I work 60 hours a week. Could you please do everything for me? So like full outsourcing, they can do that. But on the other hand of the spectrum, we might have somebody who has been unemployed for half a year and says, listen, can you teach me how to do that? I will do everything on my own. Can you just guide me through the process? And that's what we do as well. So we are really a full mm. service career consulting boutique. Mm, I see. And is there a type of profiles that you work with more like specialized or is it a little bit broad? I would, um, had you asked me that question two months ago, mm -hmm. I would have insisted that we, and I mean, it's enough to, when you look at all our statistics, mm. two thirds of our client are board members or report to the board. Uh, the remaining are experienced managers, so middle management up. Mm. Sometimes they are professionals. And that's what I would have insisted two months ago to have said, we work with the top management in Europe. Mm. Fast forward. Coronavirus times, I know that we can help many more people that need the help that have already been uh, impacted by the coronavirus. We have opened um, webinars to anybody who needs help. And what we know and what we know about the job market applies to all levels. This is not exclusive only for the C-suite. Yes. So as a company, we have decided to open up our advice and services and we offer it to everybody. Excellent. Did we go through all the main keys here or is there, are there any points that we should also look at? Like we talked about the perspective from an employer, from somebody sitting at home and unemployed for somebody sitting at home and might be unemployed soon. Um, wondering if there are other points that we can cover i have specific um tips about actually holding interviews when mm -hmm. can you share your yes. input with that like your best advice with that yeah yes before the coronavirus mm -hmm. candidates and i would have to say the majority of candidates about 80 percent wouldn't take interviews too seriously in terms of preparation. Oh, really? Why so? Because it wasn't a candidate market. Uh -huh. um, especially if they had an attractive profile or if they had been good at what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And now I'm talking experienced managers and executives. They would go into interviews with this assumption, I've been doing this for 10, 15 years, of course, I can sell myself. There's no big deal. I have been interviewing people for the last 15 years. Forgetting that interviewing people requires different skills than being interviewed. So there was a lot of ego, a lot of, oh, I can do that with my charisma, etc. But now that the, that the dynamics have shifted and we will have more demand for jobs than supply, candidates need to start taking this seriously and actually really properly prepare for interviews. This is one, one tip. So take it seriously and do prepare, read the company website, read about the person who is interviewing you. The majority of interviews is really standard and it, it is enough to Google standard interview questions and prepare the answers up front. Nobody will surprise you with, I mean, the majority of interviews is standard and they want to know, are you lying on your CV? Yes or no. And how did you achieve certain things? And what are your successes? So prepare that. And I mean, th those are very predictable questions. This is one thing. So really take interview preparation seriously from a content perspective. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, and I've been talking to patenters in the past two, three weeks, 
the majority complains about candidates not being prepared for online interviews. Mm. So they don't test their tablets, laptops, connection. Sound. They sound. Video. Yeah. They don't seem to, I don't want to seem to care, but they don't seem to be aware mm. of how little details influence how they are perceived. Because meeting somebody in person where, let's face it, there's chemistry, there is even a matter of smell and shaking hands. So sometimes with a recruiter that you have immediate, an immediate connection because of the biology that's happening in the room, which you don't have online. Mm -hmm. So there are other things that people notice first about you. It won't be the shoes because you can't see them. Um, it, there are different things. So there are things like, what's your Skype username? And if somebody, there are some... Some what, weird names out there. <laughs> yes, let's put it that way. Thank you. Thank you for putting it that way. Or when there are the more experienced candidates use than the Skype account of their kids that have very creative Skype mm -hmm. usernames or they simply don't know how to read because on, especially on Skype, there's a display name and there's a username. Some don't know the difference. And then um, the other day I spent 15 minutes waiting for somebody who didn't show up because they couldn't read their own proper username. And they failed to invite me to their Skype connections up front. Mm. So if something's important, test, do the test calls, test the sound, test the video, make sure that mm. the background is neutral or not distracting. Um, uh, an executive search consultant shared with me the other day that one of her candidates insisted during the interview that she was very detail oriented and very perfectionistic, et cetera, et cetera. While in the background, you could see uh, dirty dishes. Oh. And you'd be like, what? Yeah. Or I talked to a, a CEO the other day and I understand I'm not the recruiter, I'm the career consultant, but still it, those people also make an impression on me. And I then, if we get requests uh, of companies who know what we do, they might say, listen, do you know somebody who you could recommend to me? And then I remember not the CEO who is really good at change management, but I remember the CEO who would sit on a chair with a pulled up knee and shirt, iron shirts on a rack behind him. That's what I remember about this person, not the, the professional context. Mm. So people forget these things that online, it's already difficult to interview in person. And online, again, adds a different dimension to it and people forget that or they're not aware of it. Yeah, don't come to an interview with a pyjama. Or... <laughs> For example. <Yeah. laughs> Good, good. This is very valuable, very insightful. Thank you for sharing all these tips. Very valuable. So as a takeaway, I'm trying to create a little summary here with three or four key bullet points for people who can, um, that they can take away with them. Like, and, and correct me if I'm wrong with that. So I, I wrote down reskill. Mm -hmm. I wrote down prepare. I multiplied by three. Prepare, prepare. At prepare. least. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> prepare. And what would be the third one? Reskill, prepare, and... I think one of the things that people also underestimate overall mm. is to take job search seriously and treat it as a project. Mm. That falls a little bit under prepare, mm -hmm. but here then I did some prepare a plan. Make sure to look through the four steps and see, okay, do I, is it precise enough? Am I precise enough in terms of what goal do I have or, do I, or is it too vague? Mm. Do I know what my unique selling proposition is or do I sound on my profile like all the other thousands of mm. managers on LinkedIn? Because on LinkedIn, um, there's actually, um, uh, reg you can find um, most used words on LinkedIn, on the LinkedIn profiles, and everybody's a team player and motivated and experienced. And if you sound like everybody else, then that, that's definitely not unique. Mm. 
Mm. And so anybody who is already looking for a job or plans on looking for a job, I'd really recommend them to treat the job search process like any other project they would have at work and say, okay, week one, I'll make sure I have a goal and a research if the goal is realistic and how many companies I could work for, etc. And then week two, make sure you have the documents and the LinkedIn profile and week three, do this. So really to take it step by step and stick to the schedule and deliver um, on the deadlines, but then you deliver it for yourself, mm. not for your current or former employer. Very good. Thank you. And um, uh, I would have added also look for help if you need help. Definitely. Yes. I will put some of your links in the show notes. Mm -hmm. One last question. And okay. oftentimes I say last question, but it's never last question. But this time, <laughs> let's try this time. What about the sports industry? I just thought about that now because I do have some clients in, in, uh, in the sports and maybe wondering some of them will be listening. Do you think the sports, competitive sports, uh, athletes and all that will be affected by the whole uh, situation? I mean, Olympics are cancelled, I believe. And That's what I just want to say. I think mm. you know the answer. Mm. And I think this is a big, big question mark because sport is tightly linked to being able to move mm. uh, to competitions. And until we don't know if and how we'll be able to travel mm. and how this will be restricted, you, I think this, is, uh, this would be a super tough prediction to make. But definitely, um, okay. it's like, um, and here for all sports people, I'd say look at different career paths and different alternatives yeah. to uh, be on the safe side. So the you same have key, something to fall back on. Yeah, the same key point, like reskill or develop your skills and prepare and yeah, preparation is the key. Thank you, Sandra. Am I pronouncing Sandra correctly or is it Sandra? Sandra. <laughs> No. Well, it depends on the language, but in Austria, it's Sandra. <laughs> Sandra, okay. Thank you very much for this. This was very uh, helpful, and um, I'll be sharing it as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you would like to add? I already started thinking about that about two minutes ago before you mm -hmm. asked me that question. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else? Um, you said to ask for help yeah and here i i think i want to add something sure ask for help but be sure to know who to ask help for from mm -hmm. and i don't that it's not about marketing my company now it is about making sure that people get the right help what do i mean very often also our clients before they come to us, they ask for help from their friends. From their friends in a perspective, what do you think about my CV? Because they are colleagues. Now, this is a source of information, but when asking for feedback on documents, for example, or on your job search strategy, it's better to ask somebody that is within your target group. Mm -hmm. because if you are a fine an accountant and you ask another accountant hey what do you think about my cv they will well compare probably to their own cv but that accountant should ask a chief accountant or the finance director listen what's missing in my cv because these are the people there will be applying to i hope that makes sense what i'm saying it does now. make sense yes yeah yeah also um if they have recruit if you have friends who are recruiters hr professionals etc don't listen to just one person or don't ask just one person because and i do believe especially people in hr that are in hr because among others they like developing people etc etc but they will share their advice from their own professional opinion from their point of view so here again make sure to get feedback and opinions from not one recruiter or one HR person, but at least five or 10 to do a little bit of market research, because often you will even find contradicting tips. 
and all of them will be right because they're sharing it from their own point of view. So getting help, yes, but get way get help the right way. Makes total sense. Thank you for adding that. Very important indeed. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Sandra. And uh, I will be sharing uh, links to uh, your profile in LinkedIn, if you don't mind, and also mm -hmm. to um, your company mm -hmm. uh, on social media, as well as in professional sites and the websites. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll be in touch very soon myself. Perfect. So I wish you a very nice uh, day uh, in Portugal. Thank you. And uh, speak very soon. Yeah, talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.